All right. I need three volunteers. Thank you, Cameron. Come right on up here. Yep, come on. Josh, volunteer. Yeah, no, 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 no. You stood up, my friend. That's the way it works. All right. Three guys. This is, this is going to be good. Now, we're going to have a wrestling match. And, uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's right. There is a phrase that has brought fear in the hearts of many a people over the years, right? Just the, the mention of these two words sends a cold chill down your spine, and especially since you're standing on the stage in front of all the congregation, it's probably going to be multiplied. Those two words are pop quiz. Pop quiz. Okay? Now, um, we are going to take a pop quiz today, and, and these three gentlemen are going to help us Pop quizzes are designed to do two things. If you're a teacher, you know what these two things are. Maybe that should be the pop quiz. Maybe I should quiz the teachers to see why they give pop quizzes. Hmm, interesting. First, they are designed to test your knowledge about a subject matter that you may not have been 100% prepared for. Okay? The second thing that they are designed to do is to show you in what areas you need to improve your knowledge, right? So the pop quiz shouldn't be the whole great in the class, the pop quiz should serve to kind of help you along in this process. And uh, over the course of years, as pop quizzes have been introduced, if you're a teacher, you know that the first time that you mention the word pop quiz, you immediately get some hands raised and you start getting fed excuses. Well, I shouldn't have to take the pop quiz because I was out two Mondays ago, and I'm sure you're going to go over something that you covered then or you know, I'm not feeling too good. I think I probably need to go to the bathroom during the pop quiz, right? We've all heard that one. So this is what we're going to do. There is a pop quiz this morning, but I'm going to be nice, and I have in my pocket a get out of a pop quiz free card. And I'm going to give it to the person who has the best excuse as to why you should not have to take this pop quiz. Okay, Cameron says he has a baby to take care of while Shelly Caps holds his baby. Okay, I'm just throwing that out there. I torture him all the time, so he shouldn't have to stand up here for that. Okay, what's, what's your excuse? You don't even have an excuse? <laughs> his, his mom's like, that's right, you better, you just you stand up there and you take that pop quiz. All right, so whose excuse was better, Josh's or Cameron's? What? <laughs> That's right, you've been given the get out of a pop quiz free card. Okay, so here's the pop quiz. It's multiple choice, right? Okay, so pop quiz. Here's the first question on our pop quiz. If you were asked to help serve the body of Christ in an upcoming ministry opportunity, would you answer with A? That sounds great. Count me in. Would you answer with B? Oh, that sounds great, but I'm not sure, or but I'm sure that there are people who are much more qualified than me. C, I'd be willing to help, but I can't commit to being there every time. Or D, let me pray about that. What's that? 48 hours for what? You're both going D? You're going A? So you realize you're in front of the entire congregation. So, it, so if there's an upcoming ministry yeah. event taking place and we ask you, you're going to say, I'd love to, right? Got a lot on my plate right now. <laughs> I've heard a lot of excuses as a pastor, right? I've heard a lot of different people say a lot of different things. Uh, there's some go-to answers for most of those, and it usually en en enlists, uh, I'll pray about that. Let me, let me pray about that, which, which, which is kind of the uh, get out of giving you an answer card, right? I'll just, I'll pray about that. We'll see what comes up. There's another question in our pop quiz this morning. When does an excuse become a problem? When does an excuse become a problem? A, never. B, only once or twice. C, only on February 29th. <laughs> uh, 
or D? <laughs> D, when it keeps us from doing what God has called us to do. What do you think the right answer is? When does an excuse become a problem? There's no cheating on a pop quiz. You're going with C, only on February 29th. What's your answer? He's going A. It's never a problem to use an excuse. Okay, that's, uh, that's nice. Um, the correct answer is D. You both fail the uh, pop quiz. Go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, guys. This, uh, this test was meant to be funny. Uh, but it does, if we look at the test in the right light, it does bring us to an interesting crossroads in terms of how we address our willingness to serve. More importantly than that, willingness to serve God in the body of Christ. And this is the very same crossroads that we're going to study this morning about three gentlemen in the book of Luke chapter 9. So go ahead and turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 9 as we prepare to read this account. I'm going to share with you briefly as everybody's uh, turning to that. There's three definitions for the job that I do here at the church. One of them is being a pastor, uh, which means that I care for the flock. I look after the flock, uh, make visits, make sure people are taken care of, work with the deacon body. Uh, just let, let the church know the love of God through the things that I do and, and, and the care that I give. The second thing that I do is a teacher. Right? You're a pastor, you're a teacher, which means I teach you the Word of God. Show you what the Word of God says, teach you what the Word of God is trying to get you to understand at certain passages, certain places, certain scriptures, and various things like that. And I feel like uh, my particular specialty would be more on the teaching side of things most of the time. Then there's a third aspect of what I do, and that's called preaching. Right? And many of you grew up with preachers, and they preached. I don't do a lot of preaching, I admit that. Today I'm going to preach. So I'm preparing you that this isn't going to be normally what I do. But there is a reason. There's always a reason. And so with that being said, I would ask for you to go to verse number 57 in the ninth chapter of the book of Luke. And a lot of things have gone on in this ninth chapter. For those of you who were brushing through your Bible and you were looking through chapter 9, you're like, whoa, there's a lot of, there's a lot of verses in chapter 9, well, a lot has gone on just in this one single chapter. Uh, the 12 apostles have been sent out, right? Jesus has fed the 5,000. Uh, Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Jesus foretells his death. The transfiguration has taken place. Jesus has healed a boy with an unclean spirit. And now we get to verse 57. And for those of you who have the there, there's a number of different versions out there. There's a number of different things that different Bibles say. But as you get to, to 57, it talks about the cost of following Christ. And that's the, that's the heading of this particular section. And in this story, we're going to come across three men who had the opportunity to serve the kingdom of God. But were ultimately excused from service due to the true nature of their hearts. So stand with me if you would this morning as we read. We're going to be verses 57 through 62. It says this, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he, Jesus, said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for our time of worship. Lord, for our choir and their special. God, we pray as 
our children or at children's church, Lord, that even at this young age, Lord, you would pour truth into their hearts. God, they would begin to understand, to hear you, Lord, to trust in you. God, we ask as we study your word today, Lord, God, as we look at the cost of following you, God, I pray that you would speak truth to our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we, as we read through this little story, this, this little section of chapter 9 of the book of Luke, we see that all three of these men, there were excuses. There, there were reasons as to why they could not follow Christ. I believe that uh, in today's world, in today's culture, we are losing track of meanings of some words. And we, and we throw around words frivolously, maybe not really understanding and knowing fully what these words mean. And, and, and we have to be very careful that we understand exactly what the word excuse means, right? An excuse can be defined as an attempt to lessen the blame attached to a fault or an offense. Basically, you've done something wrong and you don't want to get in trouble. Right? There was an excuse. There was a reason why. Hey, I had to run that red light. Right? Happy hour at Sonic. It was getting ready to shut down. I needed to get my Route 44 Dr. Pepper. Sorry. An excuse can be used to uh, release someone from a duty or a requirement. Basically, what you're saying is uh, you've been given this free get out of whatever it is pass. Right? This free card that says, I don't have to do this. This is my excuse. This is why I can't do this. Can't run the mile today, coach. My leg's not feeling good. Right? Or my favorite, you've been excused from jury duty, right? Where's Kevin? Did you see? <laughs> Webster says the word excused can be used to make an apology for. It can be used to try to remove blame from. It can be used to forgive entirely or disregard as a trivial importance. Or it can be used to grant exemption or release of. So the things that we learn and the things that we understand about the word excuse and the story that we just read in Scripture this morning, we're going to see that there are three things, three things that hinder people from submitting fully to Jesus. We read in verse 57 as the story starts out. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. For those of you that are unfamiliar with this story, you may be thinking, what's Jesus talking about? Right? This guy's talking about serving and following the Lord wherever he goes, and all of a sudden Jesus starts talking about foxes and birds and nests. In order to understand exactly what is taking place in the three conversations we're going to read, there are some very important things that we need to keep in mind. First of all is this. During Christ's earthly ministry, the Lord repeatedly called people who were attracted to him to follow him as Lord. He would show up in towns, people were naturally attracted to him, and he would challenge them to follow him fully. Some responded to this call. Some repented of their sins. Some accepted this. Others rejected. When they found out that the demands of being a Christ follower were a little more stringent than maybe what they were willing to do. One thing that we have to all agree on as believers in Christ is that following Jesus is not a single event. It's a way of life. Please, please hear what I'm saying. Just because you came to the altar one day and you said a prayer doesn't mean that you're a Christian. 
There has to be a repentance of sins. There has to be an accepting of the Lord into your heart. There has to be the submission of a new way of life in following what the Lord is calling you to do. Jesus knew that there would be people that would come that weren't willing to submit and weren't willing to follow fully. And he, he was able to, to see and to understand these things. And so he could pick out these uh, superficial followers, right? He could pick out the ones that said they wanted to be 100% but knew, knew they wouldn't be. The second thing we need to understand is this. There was always a crowd around Jesus, right? And this crowd had this spectrum, a range, right? It ranged from the people who fully, 100% invested in Jesus Christ, believed that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the Jewish people, the Savior of the world. They devoted themselves, they followed him fully. And then on this end of the spectrum were the people who hated Jesus. They followed him to hear what he had to say because they were trying to find a way to twist his words, to get him arrested, to ultimately kill him. And then in the middle of this spectrum, you had this wide range of people that maybe kind of believed and maybe kind of understood and maybe kind of wanted to follow Jesus, but weren't really 100% either direction and just couldn't really decide what it was that they wanted to do. And non-committal interests, right? These different levels of non-committal interests. Because there were those people in these crowds, we come to our third thing that we have to keep in mind before we go any further. Jesus saw into the hearts of individuals, and he could see what their true motive was. There was no fool in Christ. There is no fool in Christ. He knows who you are. He knows why you do what you do. And so when these three men, when these three men approach Jesus at, at, at different times, and different scholars don't believe that this conversation all took place in the same place, and, and there's a little bit of debate on that, but, but with each of these conversations, Jesus uncovers a lack of genuine faith in these men and their commitment to follow him. In each of these cases... The demands of fully submitting to Jesus were too much for these men, and it drove them away. So when the first man approaches Jesus, and he walks up, and he offers his entire life to service, Jesus, wherever you go, I'm going to follow you. Jesus looks into his heart, and again, the Lord, being who the Lord is, knows who the man was. And he immediately reveals this roadblock that this man would encounter. And this roadblock um, would have undoubtedly caused many, many excuses from this man as time went on. He says, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, he has nowhere to lay his head. Which brings us to truth number one this morning. We want to serve, but we don't want to be pulled out of our comfort zone. You know, while this sounds like a very noble statement from this, from this first guy that comes up and talks to Jesus, uh, he's an excited young man, he's wanting to devote his life to the Lord, we have to look at him the way Christ looked at him. There are some things about this young man that are known. We don't see it in the book of Luke, but we're, re we're revealed these things in the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew identifies in chapter 8 of his book that this young man is a scribe. Scribes were uh, highly esteemed experts in the Mosaic and uh, Rabbinic law. Very smart. Whenever a new rabbi, whenever a new teacher would come into town or would, or would pass through um, into these areas, oftentimes these young scribes, they would attach them, and, and they would try to walk with them, and they would try to grow with them to, to, to gain more prestige, and to gain more understanding, and more knowledge, and kind of build themselves up a little bit. 
And if this is all that we knew about this young man, then we might wonder why Jesus turned him away. Why would Jesus turn away a young man that, would, that, was, that was interested in him, that had, that had education, that would have influence as a scribe? Christ saw this young man's heart. More importantly than that, he saw the motive behind why this young man approached him. This man had seen the miracles that Christ had done. He, he, he knew that, that, that Jesus was this powerful man, and, and, and the teachings were, were uh, you couldn't combat what Jesus was teaching because he spoke truth, and this young man, he saw that, and he wanted to be associated with Jesus and be part of Jesus' entourage, right? If he were granted this opportunity to be a student of this rabbi, it could mean great things for his future. The scribe, this young man, was looking for an easy way to climb the ladder. He was looking for an easy way to climb aboard this, uh, this train to a great life. Jesus saw his heart. He was seeking a life of comfort and luxury, hidden behind this veil of submission and dedication. Jesus knew that this young man would struggle with self-denial. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Do you realize that the Creator had fewer creature comforts than the animals he created? And what Jesus is telling this young scribe is, look, you follow me, it's not a life of luxury. It's going to take you out of your comfort zone. Christians, many of us have become experts, just like this young man was an expert in the law. Many of us have become experts. Unfortunately, for far too many of us, our expertise has been avoiding and dodging the bullet of discomfort. Oh, here comes the VBS director. That's something I had to do, right? We've learned how to maneuver around objects and people that make us uncomfortable or things that are going to take us out of our comfort zone. We've learned how to do the bare minimum yet still be involved. I'm still involved, doing as little as I can. For so many of us, we never fully thrust ourselves into the Lord's service. You know, if you're a guest here this morning, I hope that you've been made to feel welcome and comfortable. That's something that we focus on at Northside. We want you, when you come into our sanctuary, to feel welcome. We want you to feel comfortable when you come in here. Our goal is to be a place of worship where you feel welcome here and comfort here, but the Holy Spirit is the one that makes you feel uncomfortable. Discipleship, growth in Christ, service to the Lord. That growth can be awkward, uncomfortable, sometimes even painful. But to grow in Christ, we must be willing to step outside of our comfort zone. If we want our body of believers at Northside to grow in Christ, we have to, as a body of believers, be willing to step outside of our comfort zone. Jesus knew that this young scribe, he could never truly do that. And because of it, he was unfit to follow him. Are you willing to excuse yourself from your comfort zone in order to serve Christ fully? The second man in, in, in our story here, he takes us down a little bit of a different path than this first guy, right? Verse 59, he says, to another, he said, follow me. But this man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. 
And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now there's a couple of different ways that you can look at this, and different theologians believe different things. I've heard before that this statement was in reference to those who didn't believe, let them deal with themselves. You're now a follower of Christ, you deal, you deal with the followers of Christ, and I don't, I don't know that I believe that 100%. I think more importantly what we're dealing with here is, is what I'm about to talk about. And I know what some of you guys are saying as you read the scripture, if you're not familiar with this particular story, you're probably thinking, whoa, Jesus, all this guy was wanting to do was go bury his father. That's noble, right? Why? Why not let the guy go bury his dad? If this were the case, if this were the truth, I think there would be an argument there, but but what we have to understand is that many scholars believe this was not the truth. This was not the actual case. In fact, uh, we know that Jewish custom dictated that every, every, every Jewish son was, was responsible, and, and one of their duties was to make sure that their father's burial was properly taken care of and that he was properly uh, buried in death, and, 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 and it was a custom to bury the dead immediately after they died, right? Which brings us to this question of, what's the guy doing here? If his dad's already dead, he should be dealing with that. Many theologians believe that, in fact, this father was not dead yet. Many theologians agree that they're not even certain that this young man's father was sick at all. There's no indication of that. So what did this young man mean when he said that he wanted to first go and bury his father? There were ulterior motives. There was something else going on. What this man was really saying is that he wanted to delay following the Lord until his father had died and He had received his inheritance. There were some things coming to him upon his father's death, and if he just jumped on board the Jesus train right now, he he might miss out on that. This brings us to our second roadblock when it comes to us serving Christ fully. We want to serve, but we don't want to give up our wealth. And, and I use wealth in a couple of different ways there. Yes, obviously money, but wealth can mean some other things too. Jesus replied to this young man with a proverbial saying and rebuke of his ulterior motives. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. Jesus was by no means telling this young man that believers are forbidden to attend funerals or to care for dead relatives. That's not what he was getting at. He was, in fact, challenging this individual to leave the temporal, earthly matters to worldly people and not make them his overriding priority. There's something more important, is what he's trying to say. Secular-minded individuals are preoccupied with secular-minded matters. Let that sink in. Secular-minded individuals are preoccupied with secular-minded matters. Jesus wanted this man to go and proclaim the kingdom of God, no matter what it might cost him. Some of you may have heard of the Acts 2 church movement. Uh, It started in the South a number of years ago, and the idea behind this It was a church plant program. The idea behind it was they wanted to take the church back to the New Testament early roots to act like the Acts 2 church, where everybody shared everything, everybody worked in accordance with one another, and everything kind of went on according to what Christ had told them to do. And this was a very good program. It was was a noble undertaking. And I've talked before uh, from the pulpit, I've talked on Wednesday nights about why the church both capital C and lowercase c, exist, and what our function is in today's world, and what it is that we're supposed to be doing as the church. We gather as a body of believers to proclaim the work of the Lord. Our function as a church is to show the love of God, and to share that love with the lost world. It's pretty simple. 
The church today is full of great people. You want me to end my sermon here? I can. We can, we can be done. We can all go home. Now I've messed up my iPad. Man, there we go. The church is full of great people. It really is. The problem is, there are far too many or far too few people doing all of the work. We have some great programs here at Northside. We really do. If I were to show you the nominating committee list, the names of the people in, in charge of those programs, you probably think you were having deja vu because you would be noticing the same names in different places over and over and over. That's odd. I noticed this uh, early on in youth ministry. We go on mission trips and we take 45, 50 kids on a mission trip. And we'd be like, man, we are going to pound out the work. And the work would get done. What I notice is out of 50 kids, 15, sometimes 10, were the ones really doing the work. Oh, the rest of them looked busy. They'd rake leaves. Right? They looked busy. Nothing was really getting accomplished. Just like this second young man in our story this morning, the church the church is full of people who are willing to lend a hand at times. But not when it costs them something. Not when it comes at a sacrifice. I'd love to help out, but I can't miss work. That seems like a reasonable excuse. We'll cut some slack on that. I'm willing to help out, but not at the cost of missing out on a, on a baseball game. I'm willing to help out, but not at missing out on the cost of going shopping. And you can argue, well, those are individual things, Jason. Those are just one-time things here and there. They don't, they don't mean a whole lot, and you're right. But when you start turning down ministry opportunities over things that may or may not happen, and you put those prioritized over the service of God and the church, that's when we get into that second pop quiz question. When does an excuse become a problem? When it keeps you from doing what God has called you to do. We want to serve. We do. If we were to take a survey right now and I say, who in this church, who in this room right now wants to serve? Everybody would raise their hand. The problem is we don't want to sacrifice in order to do that service. Jesus knew that this, this, this second young man, just like the scribe before him, he would never be fully committed. He had ulterior motives. The final young man in, in, in this conversation, in this story, takes us down a route that um, is all too common in today's world. Verse 61 says, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is probably, in my opinion, as I read through these stories, this is probably the most reasonable request made from these three men, right? I'll follow you. I'll do everything that I'm supposed to do. I understand the cost. I understand that it's not going to be comfortable. I understand that it's going to be a sacrifice to me. All I want to do is go say goodbye to my family. That's all I want to do. Seems pretty reasonable. Many scholars believe that this man had heard the dialogue. 
that had taken place, at least from one of the other men. And kind of understood what it was going to take in order to follow Christ. And, and seemed to be okay with that for the most part. We ultimately see that this young man was going to be unwilling to change. His words that he spoke to Jesus revealed that his family ties were too strong for him to break away. Which leads us to our third and final point. We want to serve, but we are unwilling to risk our relationships. You know, I'll be the first to admit this is a touchy one. Risking our relationships with, uh, with people in order to serve Christ. It's difficult. What, what more of a noble cause is there than spending time with family and friends? Anyone familiar with Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You ask some of the parents in this room who have older children who have now moved out and have families of their own, and I can almost guarantee you that to some degree, each and every one of those parents would say, I wish that I would have spent more time with my kids in church and showed them the importance of what having a relationship with the Lord is about. It's not that they weren't good parents. It's not that they didn't love their kids. We talk about the risk of our relationships. In my opinion, there is no risk involved. You spend time with your friends and family at church. You spend time with your kids at church. Teach them, show them, lead them. Let them know how important serve in the body of Christ is. There will be so many things later in life that we will grow to regret, and I can guarantee you that's not one of them. For these three men this morning, the ones that Jesus talked to, and especially for this third man, he knew that if he allowed him to return home, if, if he let this man go home and say goodbye to his family, that he would probably be drawn up in the moment and he would never come back. He would never return back to Jesus. He wouldn't be able to leave his family. And Jesus replies to this man pretty harshly. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Ouch. That burned a little bit. Nobody wants to hear those words, not from a friend, not from their pastor. Especially not from Jesus. I learned at a very young Christian age how much sting these words had in them when I was uh, talking with a friend in college. and Much like this third man, they were talking about wanting to go into to doing this certain ministry project or do this certain thing, but then they kept coming up with all of these excuses as to why they didn't think it would work. And I'm like, well, you know, anybody who, uh, who puts their hand to the plow and looks back isn't fit for the ministry of, of God, and I got blasted. Not punched, but blasted verbally. They didn't appreciate hearing that. And here I'm thinking, it's the truth. But it was still pretty painful to hear. This young man's unwillingness to follow Christ and resist the urge to look back at what might have been, or what he might have left, was too great. He couldn't commit to make the changes that he needed to in order to fully follow the Savior. In uh, working through my doctoral studies a number of years ago, I, I, I did a course on receiving, discerning, and casting a godly vision for, for the church. And, and I studied a lot of, of George Barna. And for those of you who, who are familiar uh, with, with, with him, he is a statistician and uh, very, very, does very excellent work and excellent writings. And, and um, much of what I studied was, was over his books. And um, one of the things that he said in one of his books uh, the power of vision, is this. Vision is the antithesis to the status quo. What does that mean? True vision requires action, and action requires change. The status quo 
and change, they can't coexist. You either change or you stay the same. Those are your two options. How many Christians today are very comfortable sitting in their pews, taking very deliberate steps to make sure they stay within their comfort zone? Don't step out. How many Christians in today's church are only giving a small fraction of themselves to the proclaiming of the kingdom? Making sure that they have plenty of time for the things that might happen. We don't want to miss out on those. Can't commit to things at church because we don't want to miss out on the possibility of these other things. How many Christians in today's church are unwilling to change? And are just okay with the status quo. The saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it, comes to mind. I'm here to tell you, not broke and working the way it needs to are two entirely different things. Too many Christians are missing out on the blessings that God has in store for them because they're hiding behind their excuses. The young scribe, he viewed following Jesus in terms of what he could gain rather than the reception of forgiveness of sins at any cost. The second young man was more concerned about his inheritance than he was about eternal salvation of others. The final man was not fit for the kingdom of God because he was holding on to the kingdom of this world. As believers in Christ, we must be willing to step outside of our comfort zone. We must be willing to give up the things that we covet the most. We must be willing to change and grow in Him. To remain relevant in this lost world. My question for you this morning is. What blessings are you missing out on? Because of your unwillingness to let go of your excuses. What, what, what ministries in this church are struggling because the people of God are refusing to serve Him. What people in our community are lost and are going to hell because we as God's children are hiding behind this veil of excuse. It's funny, oftentimes when ministry programs or various things come up and there's these opportunities to serve, I, I don't know where people get these, but sometimes and, and often we see people show up with these get out of ministry free cards. I don't know how it works, but we ask them to be involved in a program or something and they're like, So many times I hear people say, if I'd have known there was a need in this particular ministry, I would have stepped up and done it after the fact. Or I also hear, I'd love to be involved, I just don't know where to start. Guess what? If that's you, today is your lucky day. For those of you... Um, that have pen and paper, get out pen and paper. For those of you that have your phones, your droids, your tablets, your iPads, and you can mic mark on them, type on them, do whatever, get those out real quick. I'm going to give you just a second to do that. I'm about to remove the excuse of not knowing about the ministry needs of the church right now. These aren't all of them. 
by, by no means. These aren't all, these are just a few that as I pray, these are the ones that came to mind. Sunday school teachers. We need Sunday school teachers. We have some Sunday school classes. We have a nice Sunday school program. We need teachers. We need youth workers to help Carl with the students. Men and women, both. He needs help. You don't want to come listen to me on Wednesday night? I don't blame you. Go downstairs and hang out with Carl. Help him with the students. We need young adults who are willing to help with Meals on Wheels. Guys, that's not a super heavily involved ministry. It doesn't take 20 hours out of every day to help with that. But plugging in and helping can be a huge thing. The nursery. We are always in need of nursery workers. Always. If you haven't noticed... We've got a lot of babies running around here. Well, they're not, well, yes, she looked at me when I said that. They're not running around here, but there are a lot of little ones around here. That requires a lot of people in the nursery. Right now, right now the biggest, the biggest need that we have, we are in desperate need of two more workers for our Wednesday night children's program through the summer. Desperate need, Right? It's been announced. It's been advertised. Guys, this is the program for our children. Men, women, doesn't matter. We need help. You know, there are so many times that people come into my office or or. We're just, we're just talking somewhere, just hanging out, and, and oftentimes, and, and, and they don't do this in a, in a mean way, and they don't do it in a distasteful way, but they'll say something to the effect of, hey, I was talking to my friend, and at their church, they have such and such ministry, and it's really cool. Or, hey, my friend's church does this men's ministry, or, hey, they have this women's ministry, or they do this particular ministry. Why don't we have those ministries here at Northside? And do you know what my response is almost every single time? That sounds great. I'd love to have that ministry here. Do you want to lead it? Do you know somebody that would want to lead it? Guys, we have a beautiful church. We have a beautiful facility. We have a lot of space. We have a lot of room. There's a lot of room for growth. There are many churches in our nation. They don't have that ability. They don't have that capability. They're limited by the facilities that they have. We're not. Do you know what we're limited by? The people willing to step up and say, that sounds like a great ministry. I'll lead that. You guys know me. You know Josh. You know Carl. We're not just going to go, well, I hope you don't sink in that thing. (laughs) We will help you. We will work with you. Any of you guys looked out back lately? We have a pretty big lot back there. Lots of grass. With a little bit of work, hardly no money, but a little bit of work, we would have a great couple of small soccer fields. We could do an upward soccer ministry at this church. Do you have any idea the number of kids we could reach in our neighborhood alone with an upward soccer ministry? All we need are the people that are willing to say, that sounds like a good ministry. I think I'm willing to lead that. That's all it takes. The staff will then walk alongside you to help make that happen. This morning, Satan wants you to sit there and tell yourself that I'm not talking to you. That you do plenty already. He wants you to find some excuse as to why you can't really step up to some of these things that we need help with. He wants you to stay in your pew. He wants you to remain comfortable. He doesn't want you to sacrifice anything. 
I challenge you to stop listening to Satan. Better yet, I challenge you to be stronger than your excuses. As we prepare for our time of invitation, I just would ask that you would pray. God, what what are you calling me to do? How can I plug in? What can I do to serve? God, if I haven't been fully committed to you, I want to be fully committed to you right now. What does that look like? And guess what? God's not going to be silent on that. God's going to talk to you. God's going to share with you. This church has so much potential. But all the work can't be done by just a few. We've been talking about this idea of pop quiz and everything. I wish, I wish as a pastor I had like a teacher's authority and I could say, for those of you who are in here, you're good for today. But for those who aren't here, your homework is they have to watch the sermon online, right? To say, you have to watch the sermon and, and write a, a, a five paragraph essay about what the preacher talked about. I believe this is something everybody needs to hear, not not just you guys, not just the ones who aren't here this morning, but every church member in every church across the world. We have a calling to be fully submitted to God. You want to see the church grow? You want to see the ministries explode? That comes at a sacrifice of all of us. Time, energy. But it all starts with prayer. We're going to have our time of invitation. I would ask that you would go to the Lord in prayer. Stand with me this morning as we sing. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for our time today, Lord. I thank you for your word. God, how it never returns void. God, I pray that you would challenge us this morning, each one in our own lives, Lord, in our own areas. God, that we would be stronger than our excuses. Lord, that five months from now, eight months from now, a year from now, we look back and and we see all these ministries exploding at Northside. God, we see this church making a huge impact on our community, and it all comes back to the fact that we as the believers in this congregation were willing to step up and fully serve you. We left our excuses behind. God, I pray in our invitation this morning, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray.